Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today for this webinar entitled Cattle Wrestling and Border Governance in East Africa and the Horn. And in fact, we'll speak a lot about East Africa and the Horn, but also about other parts of the African continent in relation to this issue today. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I am the Interim Academic Dean and the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I am pleased and honored to be opening this webinar and moderating it. This is just the second in our quarterly series on border governance approaches to countering transnational organized crime. A bit more on the series, the African Union strategy for a better integrated border governance from 2020 has of course some significant implications for countering and preventing different forms of transnational organized crime. And in particular, it raises questions about the possible transformation of what are often military heavy border security approaches um, into multi-sectoral and people-centered uh, border governance initiatives that could address some of these issues. Um, so the, the webinar series will attempt to provide some insight into multi-sectoral responses that security sector leaders are part of mounting in order to build community resilience to different kinds of organized crime challenges in their countries. Overall, these webinars, including the one today, are seeking to explore how the security sector fits into integrated border management approaches that can engage border communities and local officials in addressing some of the drivers of transnational organized crime. More information on our work in this domain and others can be found in our Africa Center website under the programs tab, which is also being provided in the chat. So before we introduce more about the webinar today and begin the discussion, let me first turn it over to our deputy director, uh, Re Colonel Retired Dan Hampton. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone, to our colleagues in Africa and Europe, and good morning to those connecting here in the United States. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for your interest in this program. Uh, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, I know we have many alumni connected today, and you're familiar with the Africa Center, uh, but those for those who are new, or perhaps those who need a refresher, uh, the Africa Center was established by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. And to achieve this mandate, uh, we developed the following mission statement, to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. And to achieve this mission, we're organized around three pillars within the Africa Center. The first is our academic affairs section, and they organize seminars, workshops, and events such as the one you're participating in today. Second, we have our research and st strategic communication section. And if you're not familiar with our website, I strongly encourage you to check it out. It's africacenter.org. Use it as a resource. Go to it often. You'll find lots of good information there. We have all our publications in PDF format, easily downloadable in English, French, Portuguese, many in Arabic as well. You'll also find spotlight pieces there, short topical pieces, information graphics, lots of great resources on our website, africacenter.org. Uh, please use it. It's there for you. And then third, our third pillar is our community and alumni affairs section. And when I spoke at, about the mission statement with building and sustaining those enduring partnerships, that's what our community alumni affairs section do. So it's more than just your participation in this event. It's being connected to us uh, with the Africa Center, being part of the Africa Center family. So we want you to stay in contact with us. And we have a section that that's all they do is they're there for you. So use them and let us be a resource for you. And I'm very pleased that we're able to offer this webinar today. And some may wonder why the topic or why the focus on cattle rustling for discussion aimed at informing policy decisions to strengthen security sector governance. But as the speakers will demonstrate over the next hour or so, issues of organized criminal networks, illicit trafficking, violence, and the negative impact on the economic livelihoods of communities are all intertwined around this topic. And although we will focus on case studies and empirical evidence mostly from East Africa today, this topic is relevant across the continent, from the Sahel to the border between South Africa and Lesotho. So Dr. Kelly, 
thank you for organizing this important event and back to you to kick it off. Great, thank you, Dan. Esteemed panelists, let me just go over the objectives for the webinar. We're hoping through this webinar um, to shed some light um, and catalyze some discussion on an understanding of the magnitude, the trends, and the impacts of cattle wrestling, including ways that cattle wrestling and livestock theft affect different members of border and pastoralist communities. We also hope um, to facilitate an assessment of the security sector's contributions to past responses to different aspects of cattle wrestling that might involve professionalized violence or organized crime. And then we also hope to discuss ways that security sector actors can use border governance frameworks and approaches to address cattle wrestling in ways that enhance citizen security in communities that have pastoralist traditions. And uh, I can't think of better uh, panelists for us to have um, to help us begin that discussion. So with that, let me introduce the panelists. They come from different parts of the African continent and are highly regarded experts on today's theme. We're lucky to have them with us to share their knowledge and experiences from East Africa, the Horn, and continentally. Uh, first with us, we have Dr. Kennedy Mkutu Agade. He is a professor of international relations, security studies, and peace studies at the U.S. International University, Africa, located in Kenya. He has carried out extensive research in Kenya and the Greater Horn of Africa, with a particular focus on pastoralist conflict, small arms, new resource conflicts, the impacts of mega development projects in pastoralist areas, terrorism, urban crime, and crime and violence prevention, among other topics. Dr. Kennedy also has a strong record of publications in these areas. He is a team member uh, of various uh, quite interesting research initiatives that are collaborative. He has also been a senior consultant in conflict sensitivity for the World Bank and much, much more. He has also spent six years managing the crime and violence prevention training, which was a collaboration between the Kenya School of Government and the USIU Africa University, funded by the Open Society Initiative East Africa. So welcome, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, we also have with us today, um, Mr. Martin Awey. Um, he is a technical coordinator of the ENACT project at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa. The ENACT project stands for Enhancing Africa's Response to Transnational Organized Crime. So in this capacity, he conducts research and analysis. He coordinates and manages five regional organized crime observatories across the African continent. He monitors trends, issues recommendations, and provides training and technical assistance. Previously, he was a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies on terrorism, counterterrorism, and violent extremism in Africa. And he has also previously been a political affairs officer at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague as the officer in charge of the African Union Strategic Security Unit in Counterterrorism Analysis. So welcome, uh, Mr. Martin and Dr. Kennedy. With that, I want to get uh, uh, directly to our questions. So I'll start with, uh, with Martin. Martin, could you spend about six or seven minutes starting us off by speaking to the magnitude and trends in cattle wrestling in East Africa and the Horn and or continentally? So what does the ENACT project's data and research indicate about the region's vulnerabilities, potential for resilience in some of these trends in relation to the elements of cattle wrestling that involve organized crime? Um, I was just thanking you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly, for that uh, introduction. And I also want to thank uh, the participants who are joining us from all different parts of the continent uh, and to welcome them to this uh, uh, seminar. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure for me uh, as being uh, part of ENACT, part of the Institute for Security Studies, to join the ACSS again in this important event. Uh, which, in my view, has been marginalized and uh, often referred to as um, the rural crime. Uh, so um, it is uh, really uh, interesting for me to see what has been in the periphery slowly coming into the fore. So um, with that, um, I will try to answer your question. Cattle or livestock rustling is one of the world's oldest uh, forms of crime, uh, which is even mentioned in the Bible in Exodus 22, verse 1 to 21, if you read the Bible. 
Uh, the crime is as old as the history of transhumanism, a nomadic form of pastoralism. Cattle rustling is therefore deeply rooted in human history and is not limited to the specific geographic region or continent. It is certainly not an African peculiarity. Though the continent has seen an, uh, in recent times an intensification and concretization of growing uh, nexus of cattle rustling and various forms of organized criminality. This criminal convergence has made cattle rustling one uh, a very important and potent uh, uh, crime. By cattle rustling, I mean the organized and deliberate use of force to steal cattle. Uh, I think that's the simplest definition. Uh, the key word there is the use of force. Since the problem is much bigger than cattle, uh, a more appropriate term will be livestock. So probably when I say cattle, I'm actually referring to livestock, the broader aspect of um, uh, domesticated animals, um, which I think uh, the foul definition, the Food and Agricultural Organization defines um, uh, livestock as uh, encompassing all grown or domesticated animals, regardless of age, location, or purpose of breeding, including large and small quadrupeds, poultry, insects, bees, and larvae. Uh, that's the definition uh, from FAO. Though there are uh, nuances among them, <clears throat> Cattle rustling is often used interchangeably with uh, cattle or livestock theft, cattle raid, cattle theft, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> cattle theft does not involve the use of force, and cattle raid does not always lead to stealing. So those are some of the nuances that we need to bear in mind, even though uh, the terms are used interchangeably. According to INAG research, Cattle rustling is widespread across Africa, affecting almost every country on the continent. About 18 countries, however, are in the red zone. These include Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, Ghana, Kenya, Lesotho, Madagascar, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, South Africa, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. These are the countries where I see them to be the pivotal countries for uh, combating cattle rustling in Africa. Given the high demand for meat and meat product, cattle rustling has become one of the most lucrative criminal markets. A multi-billion dollar organized crime economy in Africa, comparable to smuggling, and trafficking in persons, drugs, and wildlife, arms, and other uh, serious organized crimes. In Kenya, it is estimated to worth over 3 billion shillings, which is uh, roughly uh, $30 million. In Nigeria, clashes between farmers and pastoralists caused uh, by cattle theft in five states is costing the Nigerian economy more than $13 billion annually. An average of 542 livestock incident or livestock are stolen every day in South Africa. The economic impact per annum amounts to over 1.2 billion rands, which is roughly more than $80 million. Hundreds of thousands of people in these countries are impoverished every day as a result of cattle rustling. The humanitarian toll has also been far reaching. Over 10,000 people have perished in cattle rustling related conflicts in Nigeria in the past five years alone. Over 5,000 have died in South Sudan since 2011. Over 50,000 in the Darfur region of Sudan. An average of 60 farmers die in South Africa every day due to cattle theft. The crime 
has displaced hundreds of thousands of people. It is one of the major obstacles to Africa's effort to uh, achieve the Millennium Development Goals, particularly those relating to poverty and education. The origin of cattle rustling in Africa is not known. The issue first rose to the fore in 1750s in Swellendam, South Africa, when Kwakwa native people complained about armed colonialists or Dutch settlers raiding their cattle. The crime prevailed throughout the colonial era through cattle raid by both colonialists and Africans. Towards the end of the colonial era, cattle rustling had become an acute issue in Kenya, recording 1,578 cases in 1955 and 4,243 in 1962. The British colonialists fondly referred to stock theft as a young man's sport. Indeed, Kenya and South Africa were among the first countries in Africa to pass legislations on cattle rustling. Kenya's Stock and Produce Theft Act was passed in 1933, and South Africa's Stock Theft Act was enacted in 1944. Prior to the 1970s, cattle rustling or livestock theft was mostly conducted with canes, machetes, knives, spears, bow and arrows, sticks, and other rudimentary weapons. And the purpose was largely for local consumption. Some communities in the Horn of Africa even required that a suitor steals the cattle for the bright price that he's going to pay. In areas of South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, cattle rustling was sanctioned by communities as a legitimate crime for redistribution of wealth, a measure of bravado, bravado and power, retribution and revenge. Livestock in those days or in those communities is bravado and retribution or revenge. Life, sorry, uh, livestock in those areas <clears throat> or in those communities is the currency of the economy that explains the critical importance of cattle, meaning cattle was the currency just as we have the dollar today or we have the rand, we have other currencies. To understand the stakes and seriousness, imagine cattle rustling or rate like breaking into a bank or snatching away an ATM machine or like the cash in transit haze that we have here in South Africa. The modus operandi, financiers and authors of cattle rustling in Africa have changed from our previous understanding of the phenomenon. There is a shift from a crime for subsistence to a crime for mega commerce. A number of events occurred at the end of the 1970s that began to change the dynamics and trends in cattle rustling in Africa. The Iranian revolution of 1979, which overthrew the Shahs and brought to power Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Afghan-Russian war that began the same year, inspired violent Islamist movement across Africa, many of whom were using modern weapons, which were either provided by state or the, the, the Islamists were financed by state. So cattle wrestling became exposed to these weapons from Islamist movement. In East Africa, the ousting of Idi Amin had similar repercussions like the killing of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. Both leaders had amassed arms that became an important source for black market. After Amin's overthrow, the Martinico people of the Karamojo, uh, Karamoja er, uh, area of Uganda raided his barracks, that Idiami's barracks, and snatched away stockpiles of sophisticated arms, including AK 47s and many other automatic and semi automatic guns, which flooded the black market of the region. 
and were used for cattle rustling henceforth. Cattle rustling has since then, since the introduction of AK-47, continued to evolve with technology and the general landscape of criminality. Mm -hmm. Let me conclude. In the past three decades, noticeable in the past three decades, noticeable changes have occurred in the industry of cattle raiding. The first is the diversification of ownership of cattle or livestock, which used to be monopolized by certain ethnic groups. In West and Central Africa, the Fulanese and the Hausas monopolized ownership of cattle. In, East, in Eastern and Horn of Africa, the Karamojong clusters, particularly tribes like Maasai, Samburu, Poko, Tokana, Toposa, Nyangatun, G, and Dodot are known to be cattle herders. In North Africa and Mauritania, the Berbers have dominated the industry, while in Southern Africa, the Kosas, Shonas, uh, Kwakwas have been the main suppliers of cattle. The diversification of ownership to include more sedentary settlers urban and rich business people have it difficult, have made it difficult to trace corporate of raid and theft. Another important change is the closeness of cattle to build up areas in rural and urban areas. So we've seen the closer, the coming closer to communities of the cattle herders, which was not the case before. Huh. The cattle were far, far away from uh, built up areas. Furthermore, herders are increasingly becoming sedentary settlers, oscillating between ranching and traditional transhuman methods. The invention of big and fast moving trucks have revolutionized cattle rustling. It enables the raiders to rustle in one incident, uh, huge flocks, 1,000, 2,000, and much more, which was not the case before. Before, people could only see a couple of cattle. Sure. Now, they can see thousands. Other catalytic factors in the transformation of cattle rustling include land policy and redistribution, climate change, and frequency of drought, which have further compounded the crisis over scarce resources and shortage of arable land and pastures. Ethnic affinities, herdsmen or herders uh, seem to come from specific ethnic groups as I've discussed. We've also seen the prevalence of conflict, terrorists, and many other organized crime, uh, 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 organized crime groups, which have now come together with cattle rustlers to make the, the threat even more compounded. I thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much um, for taking us uh, far, far back in history in terms of how this type of crime has evolved, um, especially emphasizing how it's moved from a subsistence uh, sort of uh, practice into something that's maybe more professionalized, where the, we do see some organized criminal elements. Um, of course, uh, I think we'll see more of this in what Dr. Kennedy has to tell us about um, regionally uh, what's going on. So Dr. Kennedy, I know um, you have a wealth of knowledge on this, just like Martin does. Um, could you spend, again, um, just six or seven minutes getting us started describing some of the recent trends in these organized criminal elements of cattle rustling in East Africa in particular? So in other words, we're looking to hear a little bit about current trends in border areas in and around Kenya and some of the ways that cattle rustling or livestock theft affects different members of border and pastoralist communities. Um, and I'll ask you to stick to about seven minutes just so that we can go into the case study that you'll present to us. And then Martin has some reflections on policy. So uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Makutu. Uh, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, uh, NDU, for giving me the opportunity to uh, share and talk about the, uh, the cut rate and what is happening on the border areas. Uh, but for the... Participants, I want to say karibu. Karibu means welcome. First, I want to just show the participants a recent map that we've done that shows you the dynamics uh, in Kenya and, and, um, and in the region. 
Uh, go, yeah. Now, this is a map of Karamoja, an aerial view of Karamoja, and this is uh, at a time when uh, it has rained. Now, one of the characteristics of these areas is that uh, there is a lot of drought. And so the area suffers from environmental changes, which has an implication to cattle raids, as I will uh, not, uh, as I'll talk about it later. This is uh, the way the area looks like. You can see from the area of view, you can see how, in fact, those are homes, those are crowds. And when you see the way they are built, you can see the, the insecurity. Uh, and so you can see those walls and basically they are built that way so that if a cattle rustler comes uh, to raid, they have problems uh, stealing. So now this is, uh, the dynamics now. When you look at the east, the, the northeastern side, you can see the red, and then you can see the, uh, you can see the different colors. And so on the northwestern, we have uh, Al Shabab dynamics. But then when you, you you can see the the other bullets, the other bullets are basically intercommunal conflicts. And when we talk about these intercommunal conflicts, uh, cattle raids is one of them. And when you go to the northwestern side, and this is the Karamoja, uh, uh, Trukana, uh, you can see the Kenya, uh, Southern Sudan, Ethiopia border. Again, when you look at those bullets, you can see the big bullets, and those bullets basically indicate um, intercommunal conflicts. And again, there, that conflict is mainly uh, cattle rustling. And then when you come to the Kenya Uganda border, uh, uh, you can see. The, the, the border, you can, as you look at the border, you can see that the different bullets and basically that just indicates uh, cattle raids. And then when you come down to Tanzania, to the Kenya-Tanzania border, you can also some, see some bullets. And basically those bullets again point to cattle raids. And so when you look at Kenya and you look at all the border areas, you clearly see intercommunal uh, conflicts and mainly these are uh, uh, cattle raids. And therefore, let me talk about the trends. Now, when we talk about the, the, the cattle uh, raids and trends, there are four phases. Now, the first phase, which uh, Martin alluded to, is what I call the traditional. Now, the traditional phase was what I call, it was balanced, though violent. Now, what were the characteristics of the traditional uh, and balanced, uh, though violent, uh, raids. Number one, as Martin noted, this was an old age institution that has existed for hundreds of years. The second characteristics that most of the times we forget, cattle raiding was a livelihood strategy and a cultural institution in the context, in the context of aridity and mobility. Now, because of the frequent droughts, it means that the pastoralists have to move from one place to the other looking for pasture. And so the colonial government in one sense was very good because as much as it took the land, it managed to create areas where the pastoralists could basically pass through. And so when we think about cattle raids, it was a livelihood strategy. Number three, it was basically a redistribution of wealth. After the raids, after droughts, it was a system to basically replace cattle that had been uh, stolen, I mean, that had been killed by drought or diseases. And so when you think about it, it was basically a, a, a redistribution of wealth system. And number four, it was as Martin noted it was bride wealth strategy. Now, in those areas, for you to be able to get a lovely wife, you have to pay between 20 to 200 cattle. And the question is, where do you get this cattle? And so from the traditional balanced, though violent, we have seen the second phase, which is basically, as Martin noted, the militarized or the AK-47 phase. And in this phase, this phase was basically, as he noted, characterized by uh, the AK-47, whereby with the Tanzania 
invasion. Well, where, where the, when the Tanzanian uh, government went into Uganda to defend its land, when they kicked Amin out of Uganda, Amin basically left all the barracks. And one of the barracks that was uh, vandalized was the Moroto barracks. And so this allowed the Karima Jong to basically sell arms to the entire region. And the second uh, militarized stage or characteristic was the regional conflicts. The Horn has faced regional conflicts since 1970s. And so the arms that were left during the Cold War, again, have found themselves in the hands of civilians. And these arms have now been used in cattle raids. And then, of course, the third characteristics of arms proliferation in this region has been the governments themselves in two dimensions. One, because of the inadequate security in these areas, as Martin noted, most of these areas have been marginalized. And these areas, according to the colonial government, there was nothing to get from these areas. And so these areas were not provided with security. And so the post-colonial governments, one of the things they did, they followed the colonial government where the only uh, way to protect these areas was through militias, where the local communities were given guns to protect themselves. And so that was the third proliferation of arms into the, into the region. And then, of course, the, 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 the fourth characteristics of proliferation of arms in this area has been disarmament. Now, we go in and we disarm, but we don't address the demand side. And so when we don't address the demand side, as Martin noted, the cattle is the, 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 the cash cow, and therefore you need the ATM. And so you need the gun. And so the gun is a vital weapon in this area, given the fact that it's the main economical activity in this area. And so we see that the traditional balanced, though violent uh, system is going on. And then second, now you bring in the militarized AK system. And basically this leads to the third phase. And this is what the phase I call the commercialized, whereby the market economy has penetrated in this area where the, in the traditional, the butter system was the order of the day. But now you are pushing money into these areas and you have arms. And so in the commercialized uh, era, we start seeing the emergency of warlords, local elites and local politicians who arm these young chaps to go and raid. And basically, unlike the traditional system, once the cattle are raided, they are transported direct to the market. And the second uh, characteristics of the commercialized is the emergency of banditry. The young people who are supposed to be in school do not have money to go to school. So what do they do? You have an AK-47, you go on the road, and so you stop the cars, and you force the people to produce money. And so we see the commercialized cash economy how it has basically now become a criminalized activity. So we see the traditional that was not um, commercialized to now where the order of the day is cash and modernization, where these young people would want to buy modern comms. And then of course, the last phase, which I will talk about in my case is basically the devolution and develop, development. Since uh. 20, hello, since 2013, we've seen uh, Kenya devolving itself into 47 counties and devolution has come with wealth. Devolution has come with um, elites who have now moved into counties. And, and so in the next phase, I will then talk about this devolution and development where we will see roads are coming in, where we see um, 
road, uh, roads and where we see minerals now. The elites are now going for mineral and land. And so we are seeing the issue of territorialization. And so we are seeing the, the conflict uh, on borders due to resources. Um, and, and I'll talk about that uh, in the next um, in the, uh, in the in the next question, but what yeah. I want you to see, what I want you to see, is the complexity. You have the traditional system that is still going on, where the, the traditional raids, which were traditionally managed by elders, going on. You have a militarized uh, system going on, and then you commercialize it, and then now you bring development. So what it does, it creates a criminal organized system that basically requires. Uh, proper systems, proper governance systems in order to address it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. I think this was a really nice um, comparison to the comparative analysis Martin was able to give us from across the continent. So thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for taking us through those four phases. Um, and I think that now that we've sort of laid out um, some of the dynamics that we're talking about here, we need to start to turn to solutions, in particular solutions that relate to border governance. So um, in, the, for this, in the interest of time as well, um, I think I'm going to compress some of the questions that I ask both of the panelists. But Dr. Kennedy, I want to stick with you here for a minute. And I'm wondering if um, really, truly in six or seven minutes, I'm asking you to compress a lot. But you've recently conducted a study of cattle rustling and its security consequences in West Pocot County in, in, in uh, Kenya. And so could you give us a sense very briefly um, of, of what you've learned from that case study about the core security implications of cattle rustling as your study shows? And what in particular are the policy implications for border governance? So Dr. Kennedy, I'm moving sort of um, from question two into question three. So if you could um, compress your answer to that a little bit, just so that we have time. I see lots of questions coming through on the chat as well. So we wanna make sure we reserve some time um, after your presentation for those. So um, yeah, if you could tell us a bit about the case study and then the border governance implications in terms of policy response, we would appreciate that very much. So this is the map of Karamoja, no, so, so uh, Pokot. Now Pokot is part of the Karamoja cluster. And if you look at this map, I want you to look at the red dots. Now the red dots show you the, the conflict dynamics in those areas. And basically that is, um, cattle raids and basically Pokot uh, is 9,100 square kilometers uh, and it has approximately six, 600,000 uh, people. Uh, and basically Pokot uh, extends from all the way in Uganda uh, uh, into the county of Baringo. So you can see it, it goes all the way from Uganda. The, the, the Pokots straddle the border of Kenya and Uganda. And basically, Pokot is divided into two. You have an island uh, where most of the people there are now practicing uh, agriculture. But then, of course, you also have the lowland where uh, pastoralism is the main uh, activity there. Now, what are the conflict dynamics? Now, when we talk to the people, almost all of them noted that cattle rustling has reduced. And why has cattle rustling reduced in recent years? Number one, it's due to development and peace building. But also there is reduction in large scale raids such that now there are mainly small scale thefts between Pokot and other communities. So the huge big raids have now reduced to uh, cattle theft where you have um, a few young people that now go and raid uh, uh, and raid, but again, this cattle end up in the markets. And so what are thefts driven by? Number one, the thefts are driven by modern factors such as cash needs of poor youths. And this is facilitated by the market, the meat markets. Number two, the persistence of traditional factors such as bride price and the timeless motive of revenge. As Martin noted, there is a lot of revenge. And the other dynamic in terms of conflict dynamics, we find that COVID-19 led to increased thefts because the security teams were basically distracted. So you can see the impact of COVID. And so in this area, it's important for us to talk about arms dynamics because that is very interesting. Now, what are the arms dynamics? Now we have arms from current 
conflict in Ethiopia. So the, the, the arms in Tigri, we found that they are actually moving all the way from Ethiopia, Samburu to Turkana counties. And then they are coming into, um, into West Pokot. We also have arms from Southern Sudan via the Metoniko and into Kenya where they are used against uh, Marakot. So we were being, the funny bit was the arms are coming from Uganda and then coming to West Pokot and then they are moving to Marakwet and Marakwet are fighting with the, the Pokots. So it's the Pokots <laughs> selling the arms to the Marakwet, which we found to be very, very interesting. Now, uh, the thing is the, the ground that mainly uh, is around the, the area is the AK and the cost is between 10 to 40 cows or uh, between 100 to 150,000. And here, if you're talking about dollars, it's 750 to 1,200 USD. And then of course you have the, AK, uh, the, the G3, which costs between 30,000 to uh, 900,000. And that is between 250 to 800 USD. And so you can see the lucrative market in meat, but also in arms. And then of course you have the bullets, which cost between 60 to 110. Uh, Kenya shillings, and basically they are, uh, uh, the, the, the bullets are acquired from traders, security agencies, and sometimes it was noted that the CDF, and the CDF basically it's a development fund that is given to the local MPs, and we found that these funds are also seem to be used, uh, you know, to buy arms. And so what have been uh, the security interventions? Now, Kenyans should thank Uncle Museveni <laughs> because in 2007, Uncle Museveni decided to listen to uh, the ideas of researchers. And basically we encouraged Uncle Museveni to basically, if he wanted to sort out the, uh, the cattle rustling problem, we told him number, number one, security should be fast. And then number two, we told him development. And so Museveni then decided every 20 kilometers on the border, there is a military, there is a UPDF military. And basically, yes, that has actually reduced the arms coming into, uh, into, in, into Kenya. Uh, but of course, I mean, it has not sorted the problem, but it has reduced the arms. In 2019, since 2019, uh, the, there has been a, a disarmament in the region uh, and of course, the, the Kenyan government disarmed 3,000 um, uh, uh, KPRs. And of course, uh, according to the community, they say that has reduced the problem of uh, uh, the conflict because some of these guys were also involved in cattle raids. And then of course, as we talk, there's an ongoing uh, disarmament of community in, uh, in, in the area. And of course, uh, when there is a disarmament, that kind of pushes communities to be silent. And, and so uh, what this has raised, this disarmament is, it has raised secrecy about ongoing presence of arms. So when you talk to the communities, they tell you, oh, everything is peaceful here. There are no arms here. Uh, but I want to say, I want to give two stories that I thought were very interesting about the security. Number one, uh, there has been a disarmament, a, a rapid uh, uh, this, uh, a rapid defense unit that has been doing disarmament all the way from Trukana into Pokot. And there, there is an officer called Saleh. And so Saleh has been getting arms, but what he does, he comes to you and he sits with you and you give him tea. And then he tells you, you know what? You know why I have come here? I have come to pick that thing. And that is the gun. So Saleh has been able to actually disarm community communities without any uh, harshness like previous disarmament. However, the question is, given the fact that security are moved from place to place, is that sustainable? And that is a question we should ask ourselves. Um, another story that I thought was very interesting was on the border. Now, when you look at the border of, um, of um, uh, West Pokot and Trukana, and that is, uh, if you can see the, the Baringo, that, that border, now, uh, what has happened is uh, that when we went to the rapid uh, defense unit, one of the impacts in the region has been orphans and widows. 
And so one of the security came and told me that because of that, they are being, I don't know whether it's forced or they are being encouraged by their commanders to actually adopt an orphan. And so now you can see the security now are becoming the caretakers of orphans. And, and, and I think governments in the region should start thinking about that. But here also, one of the things that came up was the dialogue. The, 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 the security officers were telling me that now they have to use dialogue and diplomacy because there are arms everywhere. So if you're a security officer and you start shooting, arms will come up from the, the community. And so dialogue has become essential and diplomacy. And of course, uh, to just think about policy, I was thinking maybe we need to think about giving security officers conflict and management and dialogue skills. This need to be, uh -huh. you know, this, this needs to be implemented in, in, in some of the, the forces now. So, and then, of course, Dr. Hello? Kennedy, can I give you about 30 more seconds? I think I'll have to stop you here so that we can do questions. But these stories, I think, are really taking us in a direction of proposing some policy solutions. Let me give you 30 <laughs> okay. more seconds if you have a final word. OK, so uh, what can I say? What I can say is uh, because of peace building, because of development, there are changes. Uh, and so, again, we need to remember that security first. The moment we give people security, and then we give them development. There is no need for the gun. Disarmament is good, but disarmament results into what I call an arms race, where each community starts buying arms in order to defend themselves. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, this is a really important discussion about uh, the role that arms trafficking can play, and, and, and it certainly intersects with um, you know, livestock theft as a practice and then the organized criminal elements of, of, of this. Um, as well, but obviously um, your message here is that disarmament's not enough and there are some consequences um, politically and economically of, of promoting um, just that as a policy solution as opposed to, as you said, um, dealing with some of the not only security elements, but development or governance elements, um, some of the diplomacy elements, some of the community-based elements of um, how the security forces could be interfacing with people. So I think you've put a couple of really interesting ideas out on the table on the basis of this evidence from your case study, which I think is really excellent. And thank you for sharing it with us. I think we- Just need one, more, one, more, one more point that we need mm -hmm. to think about. Yes. We, without ammunition, the gun is useless. And therefore, can we think about the ammunition? Because in the last two decades, the regional governments have developed their own armories where they, 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 they produce the bullets, but on the ground, it seems that that is one of the sources of arms, uh, of ammunition. Now, can something be done? Because again, without the ammunition, the, the gun is useless. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Martin, let me go right back to you um, for some closing remarks before we move to question and answer. Um, Martin, I'm wondering if you could talk about another policy angle on this that we're um, interested in exploring here with our alumni. Could you describe, um, the updated Mifugo protocol on cattle wrestling that was adopted and signed by the East African police chiefs and their ministers recently. I know that uh, the ENACT project has done a lot of work on this. Um, and how do you think um, the Mifugo protocol might fit into um, approaches that fit into the AU strategy for a better integrated border governance? Well, I'll do my best to summarize here. And if Martin joins us, he can certainly chime in in the Q&A. So I know, and I don't want to speak for Institute for Security Studies Africa or the ENAC project themselves, but I've been following, and I think a lot of us in the alumni community have been following um, some of the more recent developments with the updating of the Mifugo Protocol. And now the Mifugo Protocol was initially something um, signed by various East African states, uh, states in the Horn of Africa, um, in 2008. And this was um, a protocol that was designed to deal with some of the stock theft and cattle wrestling um, elements um, uh, that were criminal in the region. Um, we recently had, um, we saw that the East African Police Chiefs Coordination Organization um, is working with member states um, in the region to update this protocol, um, particularly in, to, to tailor it to some of the more recent security dynamics um, that Dr. Kennedy and Martin described um, in their earlier presentations when they were describing the different dynamics in the region. Um, and so we've seen very recently um, some policy uh, developments on the level of EAPCO, the East African Police Chiefs Coordination Organization, 
Um, I know we have some folks from Inter Interpol's East Africa Bureau listening in today. Um, they were obviously key players in pushing this forward and making this kind of cross-border mechanism for police cooperation on these issues um, move forward in a way that's updated to some of these different phases and realities that, that, that our panelists have described. So that's a really exciting development. I know there are folks who've done research for NACT and ISS also in our audience today. So um, they're welcome to um, share more with us in the chat um, and we can share um, what you think some of the, the, the basic developments there are. But I think um, the point here is that there is a police cooperation uh, mechanism that um, uh, we're now in the phase of attempting to implement um, uh, 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 in the region. Now, there's also the question of uh, ratification of the protocol so that um, more extensive implementation can really move forward um, on the legal front. So this is a legal reform mechanism, a legal reform tool um, that is one of many in the toolbox for dealing with some of these issues related to cattle wrestling in border communities. Um, I see uh, Dio Goomba from the audience who's written a wonderful paper on vanishing herds um, in, in East Africa and Horn of Africa, who's, who's making this point about the ratification. The original Mifugo protocol was only ratified by Uganda, so there wasn't a great deal of um, coordinated implementation of the principles um, enshrined therein. Um, but with the update, we're hoping um, you know, that since all of the APCO countries have ratified it, we can move into a policy implementation phase that leads us to um, more localized interventions that are sensitive to some of these dynamics of development and governance that tie into the security, but also that um, police across borders will be able to act um, in a more integrated way um, that allows them to be nimble um, in relation to some of these organized criminal dynamics. So um, that's a summary. I wish Martin were here to summarize it for us um, better than I could, but um, that's one, one tool in the box. Um, in addition to the ones that Dr. Kennedy's pointing out. And then I think another that could be a potential uh, uh, tool of use, um, but requires further thinking, I think amongst especially the alumni and leaders in our audience is how to use the African Union's strategy for a better integrated border governance. This is a relatively new strategy that has come out in 2020. I'm thinking about how integrated border management and border governance elements of the equation fit into um, what it is that uh, people are doing, whether in West Pocot County or um, on, on the regional level in East Africa or beyond. Um, so I think um, there, I will just say, um, there are five different pillars of the AU border governance strategy. Um, some deal with um, governance issues on the local level. So Dr. Kennedy mentioned really uh, livelihoods, education, some of these key issues that are really underlying drivers of some of the security challenges um, that, that um, you know, we're all working to, to resolve and respond to um, in the region and across the continent. But there are also pillars related to um, demarcation of borders, dealing with cross-border sort of political dynamics that can also play into the arms flows or um, the, the movement of pastoralists in particular places. That can also play into the extent to which different countries are able to conduct joint patrols together or agree on the diplomacy that they're using in these border communities. So um, I can't say that um, I'm the biggest expert on this in the room. We have Dr. Kennedy with us who can maybe spend a minute or two giving his response to how I've summarized it. But um, I think after that, we'll go to the Q&A because we have many experts in the audience who want to pose questions. Dr. Kennedy, let me let you react just for a minute or two to my summary and um, let me know if there's anything that you would like to add to that. No, I think you, you, you've summarized everything well. Uh, the, only, um, the only thing I can add that I think somebody has raised is um, the, the question of uh, Uganda. Somebody has asked a question on uh, you know, the, the, current crisis, the current situation in Karamoja. And let me say that, yes, you are right. Um, one of the things we found on the border while we were on the ground is that the current dynamics are changing in, in Karamoja where the, the, the communities are not sure with the possibility of Museveni living, the, the communities are scared. But also I think this is related to the fact that both Karamoja and uh, both Trukana and Pokot, all their cattle, we have nearly 2 million, no, 4 million cattle in Karamoja, and so the Karamoja, ask, uh, the Karima Jongs are scared, and so we are see we are now seeing raids coming back. And basically, what I can say, this is a space we should watch, and maybe maybe uh, Kenya needs to start thinking about 
also putting security on the borders. Maybe that could uh, reduce uh, that could reduce um, the, the flow of arms. But I know that um, I, I know this is being done by the help from the World Bank. I know that the World Bank is having projects on border management, whereby uh, the um, for example, in in uh, in in, uh, in Masabit, they are, they've put a, a border area such that if goods come in, uh, every, you know, it's it's called the the, the I think the one uh, the one stop uh, border management, and and I think this is being implemented, and I think that if it's done well and security officers put on the border, this could reduce uh, arms flow and cattle rates. And, and but you know, Carl, you know, you summarized everything. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Um, I think what we'll do now for the next 15 or 20 so minutes is we'll take um, some reactions and questions from the audience. And so, um, uh, assuming Martin, I think something has happened with his power connection. Um, so, assuming Martin doesn't join us, it'll be all you, Dr. Kennedy. And I'm, I'm happy to jump in on anything that I'm able to um, weigh in on as well. Um, I wanted to, before we move into the Q&A, we have such a long list of questions. Um, we have quite a few special guests in the audience. Each alumnus and alumna of the Africa Center is special in their own right. So we're happy to see each and every one of you. We also have um, you know, folks from um, one of our partner organizations, IPSTC in the audience. So thank you. We have folks from Interpol and EGAD, but I also wanted to recognize some of our newest Africa Center alumni who just returned from a visit to the US um, for a two week course on emerging security sector leadership. Um, we see many of you in the audience here today. And so wanted to give you um, a formal welcome to your first alumni event. Great to see you all again virtually. Um, so uh, with that, Dr. Kennedy, let me give you two or three questions and we'll see um, what, how, how you wanna tackle them. Um, one is um, from uh, a colleague of yours uh, who's read your work before. Um, he says, it's very interesting to see Al-Shabaab involvement in cattle rustling in the region. Is there any evidence that they finance their activities through cattle rustling like we see terrorist groups doing in the Sahel, in Mali and Nigeria? Um, I know that we have um, some research from that region um, from, uh, I think, the regional anti-money laundering institutions that show that cattle rustling plays into how some of the um, violent extremist groups are financing themselves. Um, let me add another question or two um, to, to, the, to the hopper here. Um, could you discuss a bit more the politicization of cattle rustling in northern Kenya? Um, one participant notes uh, incidents often build up to, in the run up to elections. They can increasingly take place along county boundaries. Um, so in relation to that fourth phase you were mentioning, could you speak a bit more about how politics can get intertwined and are there any uh, policy measures that can help mitigate um, those issues? And then um, finally, um, from uh, another participant, there's an evolving system of militarization of Mbororos to protect their cattle as they move from one region to another. This is um, a participant from the Central African region, so a neighboring region. He says, this is at the origin of deadly clashes between pastoral um, and um, farmer communities. So how can African states address these challenges um, in relation to farmer herder conflict when this um, you know, crosses country boundaries? Um, so if you have any um, thoughts on those three, we'll, we'll go there first and we'll try to do another round. So Dr. Kennedy, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Now, the first question, Al-Shabaab involvement in cattle raids. Now, uh, we haven't, we haven't, I haven't uh, seen any evidence on, uh, on cattle raids vis-a-vis uh, -vis by Al-Shabaab. But I know, as I showed that map, there is intercommunal conflict. And so it's not clear whether Al-Shabaab is also involved in it. But we know that in terms of arms, uh, they've been pushing arms in the, in, 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 the, in the region. So there is a possibility that some of the arms that are being used, uh, they, uh, they are the ones probably either selling or uh, distributing to some of these uh, young warriors. However, th th there is a dynamic, but this is not Al-Shabaab. 
uh, in that region, there is a new emerging trend. And one of the emerging trends is the use of uh, arms on pickups. And, uh, but this is basically linked to uh, ter uh, territorial and, and probably water. And, and so th there is that emerging dynamics, which again is a space we need to look at. Now, the politicization of cattle raids in Kenya, and as uh, thanks for asking, uh, raising that. And, you know, I, I noted the emergency of uh, the local elite in cattle raids. Now, this uh, again started again towards 1979, and it seems that this has increased. And uh, just yesterday, I was talking to uh, some of my links on the ground in Isiolo, and I was being told that now what is happening is uh, some of the politicians are, are actually uh, raiding and, and pushing this cattle into the markets and using the money to campaign. But also we know that in terms of politicization, we have evidence from the ground whereby politicians, uh, the community, the communities feel that they are vulnerable. And so sometimes they tell running politicians that unless you get us arms for us to protect ourselves, we are not giving you votes. And so uh, we, uh, we know that um, some of the politicians have gone into neighboring countries and they have been caught with arms. Uh, and, and so, yes, this is, uh, uh, this is how politicians and some of the local elites have gone into, into, into cattle raids to fund their campaigns, but also to get votes. Uh, how, however, I think this is a, a governance issue. There has to be political will within Africans. Africans need to stop uh, seeing their leaders uh, perpetuating uh, crime and then just leaving them. It's time has reached when the law needs to be the law. You see, when law is perverted, everybody perverts it to their own way. And so here it's uh, an issue of perverted law. The third is the militarization of um, uh, a group. Now, this is very dangerous because the moment a, 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 a state arms one community, it leads to what I noted early in my work as a small arms race. Now, this is a small arms race within the communities where every community wants to get the latest arms in the market. And, and so and, uh, if the governments are not careful, this is exactly uh, what the, 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 uh, it results into. And given the fact that the region is awash with conflict where arms are, the arms are going to move from one area to the other. And so for the government to stop the arms moving from a, 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 a voluntary area to a safe area, the small arms races must be brought to a stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder if there are not um, questions related to government accountability institutions that apply to elites who are in office um, that can also be leveraged in particular ways. I think it would depend on the context, obviously, and and um, the particular dynamics. But I think there's some questions or um, reflections I see in the chat here about, about that as well. Um, I think that Martin is back. He had a power cut, but um, we're glad to see him back. Martin, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, welcome back. We're so glad you're back for the tail end here. Um, we're yes, in no, second... thank you very much. We're sorry to have missed your presentation. I summarized a little bit on the updated Mifugo protocol, Martin. Um, and okay. I was going to pose a question. We're in the second round of questions from the alumni and the audience. And I wanted to pose a question to both you and Kennedy um, that relates to some of what um, people are chatting about. Um, could you speak very briefly, um, we went over the AU strategy for better integrated border governance, but I think one of the key questions people have is um, what different policy measures are tools that should be in our toolbox as we think about um, responding to these issues in a way that's sensitive to cultural context, but it also deals with the professionalized violent elements that we see in this um, domain and some of the organized criminal elements. So, um, you know, uh, could you give us um, both a brief sense in relation to the AU border governance strategy, where you see responses to cattle rustling sort of plugging in there. Um, we have five pillars in the strategy, developing capabilities for border governance, conflict prevention and resolution to border security threats, 
mobility, migration, and trade facilitation, cooperative management of borders, which some, you have already touched on a bit, and then borderland development and community engagement. So if each of you in maybe like two minutes could give us a sense of within those pillars, where do you see um, some of the prime responses that could be mounted that are likely to be effective? Where do they situate within that strategy? Um, and then um, I also had a question um, about how private sector, private companies, is there a role for the private sector in addition to state responses to some of these issues? Um, so we'll go to Martin first, and then uh, we'll come back to you, Dr. Kennedy, on that. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Kat. Uh, sorry once again for the technical upset, which uh, really took me by surprise. Um, it's our load shedding season here in South Africa, and sometimes uh, this is not pronounced. Uh, no problem. Uh, so, so yeah, but um, I hope I didn't miss too much. Um, indeed, the, the, the adoption of the Mifugo protocol and the AU strategy, I see these two to complement each other. Actually, if you read through the five pillars and you, you look at the, uh, the provisions of the protocol, you seem to see that they complement each other. Um, if you take, for example, uh, pillar uh, three, which talks about mobility, migration, and trade facilitation, um, the, the, the Mifugo protocol, it's about the, the movement of people across borders and how countries need to work together to build borders. And I think one thing that the, the strategy states um, very eloquently is um, the fact that the enhancement of cross-border cooperation is crucial for integration of the region and for international cooperation. Um, so you can already see that the protocol takes this further by bringing state together to actually collaborate on blocking their borders, protecting their borders, securitizing their borders to prevent cattle rustlers from having access to it. And this is not just as a cattle rustling. Uh, we've already discussed that this is a very composite crime that's uh, uh, it's intertwined with other crimes such as drug trafficking, uh, um, uh, human, uh, human trafficking, human smuggling, uh, arms trafficking, all of those which are very complex crimes and which are very dangerous. Um, by state collaborating under the Mifugo protocol, they are actually implementing the AU instrument. Um, even though the, the, the AU strategy came before, or the Mifugo, because the original one was in 2008, the AU strategy came in, in 2020, uh, meaning that they, they, they kind of read each other because they, they're very, very similar. And I think that uh, they complement uh, one another. There's some of the things that I highlighted here in terms of when we look at um, uh, the, the, the convention itself, the protocol itself is that if you look at Article 5, which provide common offenses for member states in terms of what is it that they need to criminalize as cattle rustling? What, how do you target the industry itself? Uh, that's what the protocol tries to do to, to look at cattle rustling from the perspective of an industry, a market. What are the different aspects that support that market? Then we have Article 7, which calls on countries to actually uh, have in place the necessary legislations and the national mechanism to be able to implement the, the protocol. That's aligned with the AU uh, uh, strategy. If you look at Pillar 4, Pillar 4 talks about corporate, cooperative border management. So this is what we are also talking about here in the Mifugo uh, protocol. It talks about in Pillar 5, border, borderland development and community engagement the same objective that the Mifugo protocol uh, has in place. So um, I believe that um, the Mifugo, which came as a result of the countries of the region, looking for ways of strengthening and building resilience, came up with the protocol to set out the normative framework for their cooperation and for other uh, uh, instruments that they need in order to strengthen that resilience, the kind of policies that they need, the legislation, the operational uh, framework in place, the institutional framework that they need, all of those are provided in the, in the protocol. So I think that the two really speak to each other in a way that 
um, if you implement one, you you actually implement the other. That's a great po set of points, Martin. Thank you for um, yeah situating both of these this legal framework within the strategy um, for us. Dr. Kennedy, do you have um, thoughts here in relation to either of those two questions? Um, maybe particularly the role of the private sector, since we haven't touched on that yet. The, the yeah, well, the you you know. <laughs> When we look back in the 90s and we look at the structural adjustment policies, one of the, uh, one of the factors that the structural adjustment policy was supposed to address, it was supposed to allow the private entities to go into some of these areas uh, to be able to develop. But we find that you know, nobody will go into these areas because they are remote. They are no, some places there are no roads. Uh, and, and therefore, which, which private entity would want to go in? And so we find that even investment, investment has been hindered because you can't go into these areas. So, you know, when you talk about the private, which private? We've got to ask ourselves. Sure, and who, you see, the, the goal of, uh, you know, the, the goal of uh, a business is to make profit. So if you're not going to make a profit, what will, you what will take you there? And, and, and so, you know, uh, we, we, we've, we've got to think about the private, but what, you know, how are they going to make their money? Could they exacerbate the situation? And so, you know, uh, we've got to think through, but one, one of the things that need to be examined is the fact that the only economical viability in these areas is pastoralism. Can we, instead of, you know, because the GDP, the GDP for Kenya from cattle is quite high. Why don't we as a government and even Tanzania, Tanzania is one of the, you know, the largest country with the, with the, with the you know, cattle. Why don't we encourage meat as, as an industry, and, and, and basically it means that we'll go into these areas and help them develop, you know, ensure that whatever they are, they are doing in terms of the economy, they are benefiting. But at this point, they are not benefiting. And so we've got to change the strategies. Uh, but also, let me just give a story. And I think this is very interesting because somebody has asked a question. They've said they were in Baringo. Now, in March, I traced... 4,300 cattle from Tieti, in, from Tangu Bay. And these cattle were able to move all the way from Tieti, 300 kilometers into Karita. Now, Karita is in Uganda. So I was able to trace these cattle all the way from Tangu Bay to Karita. Now, the question is nobody attacked them, nobody raided them. And so my friend who is thinking about Baringo, could Baringo be a different issue? Could it be an issue of natural resource? And so we also need to be careful where we differentiate between uh, the elite's demand for natural resources to cut rustling. And, and so these two dynamics need to be differentiated because sometimes cut rustling uh, comes up as, uh, you know, as... Uh, 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 you know, cattle rustling is used to basically kick people from somewhere where somebody wants land. And so, again, we need to be very, very careful. We need to differentiate between the cattle rustling and the war, the conflict on natural resource and land. These two okay. dynamics need to be uh, If I could just, Kat, uh, uh, if you allow, uh, if I could just take one minute to further build on that, especially on the on the role of the private sector, which I think uh, comes out uh, in the protocol very neatly. Um, uh, for example, Article 13 of the protocol talks about empowering uh, communities. Uh, and the idea was that um, the issue, uh, uh, the threat of cattle wrestling is too big for state to do it alone. And that they need, um, they need the communities, they need the private sector. Because for example, we are talking about development in the area of tracing, marking, of cattle. That development, that innovation, mostly come from the private sector. It's not from the government. So we believe that 
the, the cooperation with the private sector uh, can actually help to bring innovation into how cattle can be protected. How do we trace it? What kind of cheap, the cheap idea, you know, which has not been further developed is something that if the private sector is involved, uh, we'll be able to have the cheap that, you know, um, we can be able to, to monitor and trace cattle wherever they might go. Um, and I think that's what the, the, the protocol builds on. It talks about um, improvement of administrative structures and strengthening security for grazers and other affected communities. Because mo the, those who are cat cattle herders, they are, they are private sector. They are not government. Yes, we, we refer to them as communities. But if they were in the urban areas, we'll call them private sector. So they are actually a private uh, sector where they are, but they, 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 they are dealing with a, a, a local economy, which is uh, cattle. And I think that the private sector has a key role to play, both in terms of collaborating in bringing innovation, the technology that we need, as well as bringing security so that the, the aspect of combating and preventing cattle wrestling, it's a society responsibility that includes all the stakeholders, including local communities and the private sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And thank you for addressing that. I think we had some questions in the chat, particularly about emerging technology. So RFID microchips that could help monitor movements of cattle. Is there a way for that to be um, part of the multi-sectoral solutions that we're considering? Um, I, it's with great sadness that I have to say we've run over time. Um, these webinars are very short and they always raise issues that we hope we'll be able to have continued discussions with our alumni and with our speakers about um, after we conclude the webinars themselves. So I encourage everyone in the audience, we weren't able to get to all of your questions, but hopefully we got to um, a significant number of them. And if you have follow up, um, we're happy to, of course, um, in relation to the work uh, that we're doing um, uh, to support you at the Africa Center to hear more feedback, um, to consider how we move forward, um, you know, um, in, in producing uh, more uh, webinars like this or, or working through other mechanisms to support you in the work you're doing to respond to these issues in your areas on the continent. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Makutu and uh, Mr. Awi, uh, Kennedy and Martin for your wonderful presentations, really helping us go in depth uh, with a basis of evidence, with a case study, with the data that the ENAC Consortium has developed and has collected through the regional organized crime observatories. We hope that by laying out the problem or the issues with data and with evidence, we've added something to everybody's um, you know, view um, and um, sense of, of what the issues are. And thank you to both of our speakers for also presenting some evidence about what is working or what is happening response-wise um, within Kenya or outside of it. And then also for linking us up to some of the most recent policy developments with the updated Mufugo protocol that's been ratified by the East African states that are, that are included um, and states from the Horn of Africa. Thank you for giving us a sense of then how this fits into a broader strategic framework that I think um, many of us believe could add some value um, to structuring a multi-sectoral response um, to these issues, um, the African Union's framework on better integrated border governance. Um, we hope to continue these discussions offline. Thank you, Kennedy and Martin. And thank you today to all of our participants who joined us. Um, uh, you know, a veteran alums who have been with us for many, many years and the, the newest alums who we've seen joining us and hope will continue joining us in the future.